In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, this is a video I really never thought I'd ever be doing, um, but I wanted to talk about um, persecutions and, and uh, kind of what uh, we see going on in governments around the world. And it was, it was a news uh, uh, article that I had read um, that there was a whistleblower from the FBI that uh, basically blew the whistle that the FBI was looking at people that were pro-life and specifically um, traditional Catholics as extremists or a, a threat to, somehow a threat to our democracy. And uh, it's just, you know, when I sat back and I thought about that, it's just astounding to even, to even say that out loud and, and know that it's, it's actually happening. Um, the Lord said that all nations will hate you because of my name. When, when we go through persecution, um, the way it's laid out in end time uh, or eschatological uh, view from a biblical standpoint, the ones that will be going through the trial are the Christians. Everything else will seem to be normal. Um, I, I, you know, I think you remember that Jesus said everyone was eating and drinking and giving in marriage and buying and selling up until the day that Noah entered the ark. And it was, you know, it was Noah who was not listened to. It was Noah who was, who was shunned. It was Noah who was looked at as though crazy. He was scoffed at. And it'll be no different for us. And so, I mean, I, it's not surprising to me, I guess. It, you know, it's just, it, it's kind of, um, how do I say? Um, it's just surreal, you know, to think that we live in a time where government agencies are uh, directing their focus at, Catholics and Christians in this country and wanting to label them extremists and, and a threat to democracy. It's, like I say, it's just surreal, but it shouldn't surprise us in any way. Um, it's just there's so much that goes on with this, you know, um, <laughs> the chemical spill in Ohio, you know, the way that was covered up and kind of, you know, <laughs> I think we started <clears throat> like shooting down balloons and, and, you know, quote unquote, unidentified flying objects <clears throat> kind of in order to take the country's attention off of what was happening in Ohio. But what, what's going on over there is very, very bad. Um, you know, there's uh, chemicals actually in the dirt underneath the water in, in, uh, in one of those creeks and one of those rivers. And so uh, we do need to pray for those people. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand that, that what we're seeing as far as, um, you know, the, the FBI or anyone else wanting to target Christians, it shouldn't surprise us in any way. You know, the Lord told us from the beginning and everything is in scripture you know i think uh i think some of the things though the reasons that we find it so surprising is because we never thought we'd see it in our day you know um but there were plenty of christians and plenty of catholics uh as well as jews who were targeted and persecuted in germany and uh there were also a lot of catholics and christians and and uh that went along with with uh, Hitler and, and his agenda. Um, so it just goes to show how deceptive things can be. And we need to stay really, really focused, you know, on, on the Lord and, um, and prayer 
and, and continue to be in a state of peace and in a state of grace. Uh, because I, I think one of, the, one of the things that I read from uh, Louisa, and I'm, I'm into her writings, um, you know, one of the things that jumped out to me was when Jesus told her, and I believe it was in volume 33, I may be wrong, but Jesus told her that the general confusion is nothing more than a preparation for the renewal. And that's the way we have to view this. We have to look at it, the confusion in the world, the sin in the world, the, uh, the persecution that comes along with um, you know, wanting to shun the gospel out of society uh, so man can live by his own rules with, with nothing to, you know, uh, how to, you know, kind of keep him on track, uh, no moral truths. Um, we need to be able to see that and recognize it as a sign that that's right in front of us. That is, is, as Jesus said, it is nothing more than to prepare the world for a renewal. And this renewal, we know, is, is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so, you know, it, I, would, I would suggest that, you know, when you ponder these things, when you look at the world, um, make sure to thank God that he gave you eyes to see, that he gave you ears to hear, that he's graced you and called you out of this world of darkness into his light. I think that approaching it that way and, and from that standpoint is much more positive than, um, you know, than, than looking at it as, as doom and gloom and the, and the world's, you know, <laughs> you know, headed for destruction and everything else. Um, I think it's, a, I, I think we should look at it more as a sign um, that gives us hope. You know, for Jesus to speak of general confusion and then for us to look out into the world and see that actually happening right in front of us and then have Jesus say it is nothing more than a preparation for a renewal. And, and that we need to view it from his eyes, you know, and kind of see it from God's perspective. And when that happens, we can start to give praise to God. We can start to thank God. Um, you know, and, and, and again, just, it, it brings about so much uh, feelings of gratefulness, you know, that even though we're unworthy, you know, God has chosen us to be able to see the signs of the times clearly when so, so many people have no idea what's going on, you know. Um, but there's a lot of this going on. You know, I mean, if, if you go back, you know, when the, when the, when the pandemic broke out, and if you, if you go back and you just like look at old headlines all the way up to today, and the amount of lies that have been told, um, it's, al it's almost staggering. It, uh, It's, it's mind-bending that, that people, the majority of the people in the world are, seem to be asleep. And, and, you know, just life goes on as, as normal. They don't even seem to have a, <coughs> a cognitive ability <laughs> to reflect and say, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was duped, you know, when you had, uh, you know, two weeks to slow the curve. And then, uh, you know, Ukraine would never join NATO. And I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. You know, uh, the laptop was Russian disinformation. Um, it's just amazing, you know. And, and, there, and even now, you know, with the things that are flying over the country and we're shooting those down, you know, what's happened in Ohio, we have food plants that are burning down, um, you know, seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, they all seem to be distractions, you know, um, to bigger things. You know, it's, it, we, we had said, or they had said uh, prior, oh no, you know, we'll, we'll never send tanks and that to Ukraine. We'll never send, you know, long range weapons to Ukraine. And they're doing it, now they're doing it. And, 
so and now it's coming out you know from what i've read that there's actual um there may be proof that that the united states was behind blowing up um the the uh, pipeline russia's pipeline and if that's the case it's an act of war and so you know it's like i said there's just so much deception and and that that is one of the main reasons that we have to see even more focused on the gospel and more focused on Jesus and um, and more focused on what we're being called to, you know, prayers of reparation, um, fasting and penance, um, pray the chaplet of divine mercy every day and offer it for the sins of this country and reparation for the sins of this country, um, especially the sin of abortion. You know, um, I, I knew that when Roe v. Wade was overturned, there was going to be a great... Um, pushback and we saw a lot of that we saw a lot of pushback and and uh anger and violence and you know but now it, it's coming from from a government agency you know and it, you know that's one thing that they they know you know satan knows is that you know attacking christians attacking evangelicals um you know protestants whoever they are that's one thing but they they know that they have got to somehow remove the influence of the Catholic Church. And that's why it's so important um, that we have bishops and priests that will stand up against this. And, um, you know, I can't speak for anyone else or, or any, any other Catholics, but, you know, if the government's going to attack traditional Catholics um, and call them extremists, then they're going to have to call me an extremist too, uh, because I am Catholic. And uh, I think we probably agree on more than what we don't. And it's our faith. It's our church. And we have to defend the church. We have to defend the truth. We have to defend what the church teaches, stand our ground, and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what. And uh, so, I, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if these types of things um, go on even more and even escalate even more. Um, you know, it. I wouldn't put anything past them at this point. You know, false flag attacks that are pinned on on a, a Catholic group or, you know, a, a Catholic parish. Um, you know, they, that's the way they do things. You know, they they uh, they deceive, and so you know that's part of part of one of the ways they they persecute is they deceive, and we're seeing we see that in general on a global scale. You know, um, really the, the, the power and the control that was taken during um, the pandemic was never really given back to the people. And, um, you know, they, I mean, this whole thing about the, the vaccine and it's still going on, you know, but report after report after report is, you know, they're coming out now, you know, that death worldwide has increased by 30%. And, and not from COVID. And so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, that those kinds of things, that lockdown and all that did a lot of damage to a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of people lost hope. And, uh, you know, again, that's one of the reasons that we're so fortunate to be Catholic. We're so fortunate to have a relationship with the mother of God, with Mary, and, and understanding and knowing these authentic apparitions that have happened all over the world and her promises and the prophecies that have been fulfilled continue to be fulfilled and in the end will completely be fulfilled. You know, um, I think there's a lot of Christians out there, a lot of Christian people that love Jesus, but they have no idea of, of the magnitude of, you know, the apparitions of Fatima and Lourdes and, uh, you know, La Salette. You know, hopefully we can we can really get this message out. And um, <clears throat> there was a young lady that had left a comment, and and uh, she, I don't believe she was Catholic, but she asked, you know, just do I have to be Catholic to have a a, a relationship with Mary? And and my immediate answer to that was no, you don't. And Mary loves all of us. She loves all of her children. There is no possible way Mary can love Jesus the way she loves him and her not love all of us. 
um, in the same way. It's absolutely impossible. That's like saying Jesus loves the Father above all things and, and loves us, but doesn't like other people. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't, theologically, it just doesn't work. And so, um, you know, a relationship with the Blessed Mother right now, I think it's so important. And, and it's, it's something very special because Our Lady is so nurturing and, and so caring and so loving. Um, like a mother, and and it, it's just, it. I mean, what an amazing gift to have Mary. You know, to have Jesus give us His own mother as ours is 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 a gift beyond anything I think we will ever be able to comprehend. And um, you know, that's where our focus needs to be. Our hope needs to be in Jesus and, and in Our Lady's love for us and, um, and doing the will of God perfectly, you know. Um, it's just, she's just so concerned, you know, about the world, about us, and, and, and is calling us to prayer, is calling us into a deeper relationship with, with Jesus. Um, you know, I, I will say that, um, in reading Luisa's writings, and I'm, I'm moving along in this pretty pretty rapidly, um, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, they're ex the writings are extraordinary. And I, I'm glad I got the book that I did with Father Inuzzi because then you have a theologian kind of break things down. And I think that's probably a better way to do it. Um, for me anyway, that's the way I would prefer uh, to read mystical writings is to have a theologian, a trained theologian, be able to break down what you're reading, you know, to make sure that you, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that you're not misunderstanding something or reading it in the wrong way. And if there's something that sounds kind of like out there, you know, you don't really get it, you know, you have a theologian that can explain it. And so I, I have found it extraordinary. Um, it's extremely deep, deep theology in very mystical, very spiritual um, writings, um, but truth, centered in truth. And um, the I, I found myself, again, <laughs> going back to scripture. Um, you know, it, it, our, Luisa's writings really revolve around the divine will. And um, the divine will indwelling within us in its fullness. And this is the gift. This is the gift that's going to be a given. This is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This is the flame of love that burns within the heart of Mary. Mary's love for God and for her son are perfect because she lives perfectly in the divine will of God. Therefore, she loves God and Jesus perfectly. And if that's the case, she loves us perfectly too. Now, in, in one of the, the entries that I did in an earlier video, um, Jesus was explaining to Louisa that because Mary possessed it on earth and possess it, possesses it in heaven, it is her gift to give. And I think it's the same message, just with different names, the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, the divine will of Jesus, this this powerful uh, divine will that dwells within the heart of Mary, that envelops her entire being, um, is hers to give freely. And it, it, like I said, it's extremely deep, deep theology. And I really find it um, not only fascinating, but enriching um, from the standpoint that it is opening more doors for me um, as far as the scriptures go. Um, what I found myself doing was thinking of everywhere in scripture where it speaks about the will of God. Um, many will try to enter the kingdom of heaven, um, but the only ones that will do so are the ones who do the will of my Father. Um, in contemplating the Our Father prayer, which I have done over the years, 
um, I began to see it in a different way. You know, not so much thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but give us this day. You know, there's two ways to look at it. Give us this day as in, you know, today, right now, or that day in which thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and the will of God being the daily bread, okay? As well as the Eucharist. It's, it's just, like I said, it's just extraordinary to read. Um, and very, very deep theology. Um, one of the things that I liked about it was um, it, it kind of tied in to um, what I've talked about before with the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, that, that God exists outside of time. And, and, and Jesus promises St. Faustina, that if we pray the chaplet for the dying, right, um, he guarantees that soul's salvation. And, and so, you know, as I've said before, if we pray a chaplet from the heart for the salvation of a loved one, which is in accordance with the divine will of God, because he wants that person to be saved, and we ask Jesus to hold that chaplet from our heart with our tears, and to apply it at the moment of that person's death, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Jesus would answer that prayer. And, and the, that person, um, I believe, will be saved. Um, for one, it's a prayer that's in accordance with the will of God. For another, it is a promise that Jesus made to St. Faustina. Number three, it is a theological fact that God exists out of time, therefore everything past present and future is ever before him. And number four, it, it, is a, it is a prayer that falls in line with the theology of living in the divine will. And, and I'm saying this because of, of the, some of what I've read. In other words, when we pray for the salvation of a soul, Okay, even if that soul were to be lost, God receives the same glory as if that soul had been saved through us praying in the divine will of God. It's just a powerful thing. I mean, when you think about all the intercession <coughs> of the saints, <coughs> of the angels, um, it's, an, it's an extraordinarily powerful thing. And uh, this is this is I think is the way. And again, I'm only at the beginning of theology, but I think this is the way that they were talking about the soul of Adam mystically by locating, um, and that we're, we are called to the same thing. So again, it has to do with God living outside of time, and we can mystically, through prayer, in the perfect divine will of God, mystically apply a prayer to someone that's in our family that has long since been dead. And it, it's just, a, and God receives glory through that. He receives praise through that. Um, as if the person themselves had been converted and went straight to heaven, you know? Um, but again, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this. Um, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can before I get to this conference. Um, I do know what I'm gonna talk about. Um, Probably not too much of the theology of that, um, the divine will and Luisa Picaretta, um, because there's there's more important things I feel that the Lord wants to do there. Um, but as far as persecutions go, we need to understand uh, that the world, the majority of the world, will continue to live as it is living. Okay, um, in both examples that Jesus gave. Okay, he said, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating, drinking, buying and selling, giving in marriage, you know, and um, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And, and so the, the world will seemingly be going on um, in a normal way. Um, 
the ones that will be shunned, the ones that will be persecuted, the ones that will be hated by all nations are the ones who love Jesus, the ones who hold fast to truth, the ones who are trying to live an upstanding and moral life um, in accordance with the divine law of God. And so, um, again, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see this increase. Um, you know, with, with the amount of immorality and sin that we see in the world, with what we see happening with Russia, understanding Our Lady's prophecies about Russia, um, with the Holy Father's consecration to Russia, um, and the way we see prophecy coming together in, in the church, and, and this, this whole unveiling, if you will, um, of the apocalypse, um, which means unveil, right? And we should think of it as the coming renewal because that's what it is. Um, I don't know how anyone can't see this. Um, I don't, as I said before, I don't know of a time in history um, that has been this profound on, on such a level. You know, when you think back even just a few hundred years, you know, with the massive revelations of Fatima and then divine mercies given to the church and then Luisa Picaretta, you know, and then you have sprinkled in um, the messages of Father Gobi and Elizabeth Kendleman, um, you know, Garabendal, the prophecies happening, you know, basically being fulfilled right in front of us and, and the, mo the majority of the world asleep to this. Um, it is an absolutely profound time we are living in. And it is a time that we need to be um, joyful. We need to be hopeful in this um, and enthusiastic. You know, um, we have got to get to a point in our Christian life where, where we are ready to let go of the things of this world and embrace um, what is new and what is coming. We need to get to a point in our Christian life to where we allow God through, through our own choice, by our own choice and by his grace, we allow God to absolutely annihilate our will and replace it with his. And, and it's, a, it's a constant prayer. You know, it's one of the reasons I've talked about before about praying constantly or unceasingly as St. Paul says, we don't have to be on our knees all the time praying to be in a state of prayer. As I've said, they can be small little prayers, little prayers from the heart. Um, you can look at a beautiful flower that you see or a plant that you like and, and, um, and say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for a beautiful sunset. Thank you, Jesus. As a matter of fact, you could even go as far as to say, Look at that plant, look at that flower that you, you're admiring and say, I redeem you in the name of Jesus Christ. We play a, a very, very important part in the redemption of the world. Um, we we wanna be so one with Jesus. And I'm, I, I'm talking about beyond, um, uh, you know, the unitive state <laughs> we want to be so one with Jesus that Jesus is the only thing that that pours forth from everything we do. Um, our, our sight, what we see, what we speak, what we do, um, the, the work that we do, everything. We want Jesus to be pouring forth out of everything. Um, one of the w other ways that I've worded this is that Jesus wants to be intimately connected, intimately connected to every aspect of your life. And that's what we need to strive for. We can't allow the other things to distract us. The persecutions will come. Um, chastisements will come. You know, wars will come. And some of us may die as martyrs, but even then we won't feel it. We won't even know what's happening because we'll be in such ecstasy, <laughs> you know, that that our martyrdom will actually probably convert those who martyred us. Um, it's a powerful thing and an, and an amazing, amazing time to be alive. Um, but don't be surprised, again, if you see an increase in this. You know, eventually 
they are going to try to shut down the church. They are going to try to shut down any way they can um, those that spree, speak the gospel of truth, those that stand for the teaching of Jesus Christ, those who follow the law of God, those who want to live an upstanding and moral life, um, those who are filled with grace. And it is that grace that will get us through those things. So we don't need to worry about it. We need to pray and we need to be confident and trust in Jesus and trust in the intercession and the love of the Blessed Mother because she will never, ever, ever abandon us. Never abandon us. She will be with us through the whole thing. Even if it seems like she is not there, she will watch over us and, and she will protect us. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna close with a thought because there was uh, another viewer that had, had um, left a message about, um, I think what I said about the, and again, it was just a, a theological thought. When did the divine will enter Adam? And, um, you know, kind of dealing with the, the fossil records and then looking at it from a biblical standpoint, from a numerical standpoint, biblically, we've really only been around 6,000 years. And um, I think I did find the answer and I, I responded to her. Um, in in the writings of Louisa, that that the divine will of God was was in Adam from the moment that he felt life. Okay, so that that was the answer to that. But still, I had the question, and I've been mulling it over. Um, you know, how do we have all these these bones and these artifacts that are millions and millions of years old? And I'm speaking of human um, bones and things like that. And um, one of the things, there were a couple of things that came to mind. Um, one was uh, a friend had texted me and, and um, actually said something that I had thought about before um, and kind of reminded me of it. But I, I kind of wondered before, I wonder if the, um, if the way we do carbon dating is, um, if, they're, if they might not be missing something. And then I had the idea, what if they're doing carbon dating and they're only dating it back to 6,000 years, but they really don't want the world to know it because then it proves the Bible true. That's another way you could look at it. Um, the other way to look at it is that at the, at the deluge, um, that, that somehow God's wrath with, within that, somehow the, it, it, it changed... Um, the makeup of, of those that were outside the ark. In other words, they, they would have looked, you know, somehow been, seemed to have come or be older than they actually were. Again, I don't know how it works. It's a mystery to me, but I, I, you know, I, I do apologize. I didn't mean to confuse anyone. It's just the way my dumb brain works. I think about everything and I, you know, and so I ponder things, I meditate on things. I, um, I contemplate things. And um, I could spend hours, you know, I, I, you know, I think after I did the video, I actually sat there for at least 20 minutes trying to think, how does this work? You know, how does this happen? Um, with that being said, I will say that I, I am uh, pleasantly uh, surprised when I read Luisa's writings and Jesus says that he, you know, that the, the world is renewed every 2000 years. And that um, that absolutely fits um, scripture perfectly. And it also fits what we are seeing now, the makings of what we are seeing now, both good and bad, okay? The next renewal is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The next renewal is the kingdom come. The next renewal is the triumph of the church, the conversion of Russia, the conversion of China, the conversion of the world. Um, so we have to understand that if you're, if you're gonna renew something, okay, there's usually work that has to be done before that. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring a piece of brass to its original state, it has to go through a lot of things. You know, you've got to, you've got to clean it and you've got to, you know, even sometimes soak it in a mild acid, um, you know, to get all the tarnish off. But once that is done, you know, 
what what is left over is is beyond uh, beautiful. It doesn't even resemble what it was before. And that's the way we have to look at this. That is what is coming. Um, we await a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And every single one of us have been called into this glory, into this unbelievable gift and grace that God wants to bestow on the world through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And, and we are doing just fine. You know, it's a, it's, we, do, we take baby steps. Sometimes we fall down. Sometimes we wander off. But, you know, we always come back. And, you know, we're making headway. The church is making headway. You know, I, I feel um, or sense a great, great renewal coming in the Catholic Church. Um, just the spirit will be poured out and the gospel will be preached, you know, and that's really when the persecutions will come. They're gonna wanna shut everybody up. They're not gonna be able to explain these, uh, these people being healed or, um, you know, the joy that people are feeling. The last thing Satan wants is for the world to have hope. And nothing gives a person more hope than when they experience an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit into their soul. It is pure, absolute, eternal love. And, and the joy that that brings a person changes a person's life forever. You know, some people call it born again. And it is because you never forget an experience like that. That's what we need to be focused on. Um, not, not the world going insane. And if we're gonna pay attention to the confusion, then we need to identify it the same way that Jesus does. That it is nothing more than a preparation for a renewal. And for us to understand that we are a part of that renewal. We are a part that will be infused with God's love and God's Holy Spirit when he pours his spirit over the earth. And it, it, it's just an amazing thing, you know. I don't know about you, but I could use a renewal, you know. I got, I got a knee that hurts when it gets cold. Um, I'd like my beard to go back black, you know. Um, I could use a little bit of a renewal. So um, anyway, I think that's the way we need to view these things. Persecutions are, are nothing more than, than what Jesus said about the confusion. They're a sign. If you're persecuted for loving Christ, if you're persecuted for loving the gospel, it is an absolute surety and a sign that you love God and that you are a child of God. And you should never, ever, ever forget that. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may he grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.